Well, hey, everyone, and welcome. We're so excited that you are here joining us today. Wherever you're tuning in from, maybe you're tuning in from your living room online, maybe you're on your couch, or maybe you're at one of our locations here today, welcome. We're honored that you are here. My name is Blake. I have the honor and the privilege of serving here as the Gulf Coast Campus Pastor. And before we do anything else, before we move forward into the message a little bit, we just want to take a moment and pause. This is what we've been doing over the past few weeks and say this to anyone, to everyone who may be tuning in after a long time of being gone, or maybe you're just now coming back, or maybe you have never been to church before. Maybe this is your first time experiencing venture. This is the only thing that we want to say. Welcome home. Welcome home. We're honored that you are here. We're so excited that you are a part. And here's the thing. You couldn't have picked a better week to be here. You couldn't have picked a better week to come in because here's what I know is that every time that we gather together and we say this welcome home, we mean it because this thing that we're doing, this thing where we gather for, this thing that brings us all together called the church, it's important. It's important. What we do here is vitally important to the health and the well-being of people because we realize that when we come together and we see what God is doing and the community that he is building in the church, that the words welcome home that we use can be meant. And we can say, hey, it doesn't matter what your story is. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what difficulties you faced in your life. It doesn't even matter what you did last night. All that matters is you're here now and welcome home. Because we believe this. We believe that the community is most important in a crisis. Community is most important in a crisis. When we get together and we're able to look at each other in the eyes for 15 minutes, we're able to chat with each other online, we're able to come together and realize that we're not in this alone. We're not in this alone. Yes, the world is crazy right now. There are so many things being thrown our way. Every day, it seems to look like we don't know what's going to happen, but can I tell you that we can have confidence in who God is and what he is doing in the life of his church. We can be confident in that. And this is what we know, is that our faith is fueled by the community that's found in the church. Our faith is fueled by the community that is found in the church. I love what Hebrews 10 says. It says this in verse 24 and 25. It says, and let us consider how to stir one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I believe that we're in an all the more kind of season, right? We're in an all the more kind of season where we need community, where we need to come together. And so for that reason, we say to anyone and to everyone today, welcome home. Welcome home. And I am really excited that you're here today as well because over the past few weeks, we've been walking through this insanely old wording, this text that's called a creed. It's called the Apostles' Creed. And a couple of weeks ago, we heard from our Jones County campus pastor, Kyle Warren. He gave an incredible word on truth. And how do we find our truth? How do we find the things in life that we can measure reality against? And then last week, Pastor Jeff talked to us about creation and God the Father and how God the Father is the great creator. And if he created you, then he created you on purpose for a purpose. And so today we're going to take the next phrase of that. We're going to take the next phrase of this creed and we're going to talk about it. And I love this phrase because it is probably one of the most pivotal pivotal statements in our entire faith, in everything that we believe. It focuses around one thing, and that's the name of Jesus. And so this is that phrase, right? It says this. It says, we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord. Entire entire faith was built around this one statement. And it's really easy to say. It's really easy to talk about it. It's nice. It fits in a little package, something that we can carry with us in our pocket. But here's the question that I want to ask each and every one of you today, including myself, is who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Because it can be really simple, right? It can be really simple to go in and to look at this phrase and say, yeah, I believe that. I'm about that. It's a really nice phrase. I say it all the time. But who is Jesus, honestly, to you? But first, we may need to define for many of us, for many of us, you may be here today and you're seeking after what that means. Or maybe you've never been to church before and you're trying this thing out from the very beginning. Can I tell you what gets us so excited is answering the question, who is Jesus? 
Who is this Jesus, the eternal firstborn of all creation, as it says in Colossians chapter 1? He is the eternal God, the Son, in John chapter 1 that says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was eternally in the beginning with God, and everything that was created was created through him and for him and by him. And so when we come into the picture, God creates humanity, right, to be workers, to be, to be helpers alongside of his great, great creation. We come in and we just screw the whole thing up. We take a bite of the apple and then sin enters into the world. But can I tell you something that's incredible about this story of Jesus is that God knew from the beginning of creation, from even before time began, that we would mess up. And so he sends his own and only son. I love the verse. Many of you know it, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him, in Jesus, shouldn't perish, but have eternal life. I love that verse because it shows that God in his foreknowledge, he knew that this would happen. So he sends Jesus to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect life on this earth, to get a ragtag group of guys of 12 men and bring them along with him in ministry for three years where he's healing the sick, he's giving sight to the blind, he's raising the dead, he's proclaiming this upside down kingdom of God. Where he says, where the last shall be first. Then he does all this and he kind of breaks up the waters a little bit, right? He kind of shakes up the, the, the tree a little bit and all of a sudden the people who are in power say, hey, we gotta kill this guy. We gotta kill this guy. But what they didn't realize was that when they killed Jesus, that he was willingly giving up his life for you and for me. And that is the story of the gospel, is that there is a moment where he hung on a tree and everything that we have ever done, everything that you have ever experienced, everything that you have ever received was paid for right then and right there on that cross. And in that moment, when he was put into the grave, it seemed like all hope was lost. It felt like this whole story was going to stop even before it started. And many of you may feel that same kind of hopelessness right now. But can I tell you something that's different about our faith, something that's different about our Savior, is that three days later, that same Jesus, the one that we proclaim, he raised from the dead. He's not in that tomb anymore. He's not there anymore, and he is who we celebrate. He is now at the right hand of the Father, and he is interceding on our behalf. And he is King of kings. And Lord of Lords, this is who Jesus is. But the question is, who is Jesus to you? There's a story in Matthew chapter 16 that I absolutely love. I I love Jesus. He kind of brings the disciples on this little track, right? Like he brings them in ministry and they're kind of traveling here and there into different places. And then all of a sudden Jesus will just like stop and he'll like turn around and ask a question. And the disciples will have no clue how to answer it. It's one of my favorite things in all the scriptures. It's in Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. And I'm going to read it to us, and we're going to dive into this question, who is Jesus to you? Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell cannot, will not, shall not prevail against it. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you. We're so honored to be in your presence today. Father, for everyone who's coming back for the first time or maybe just coming for the first time, Father, we pray that they would feel your pleasure in being here, that they would receive welcome home as something to be grasped, Lord. But ultimately, more than anything else, that they would receive your word, that we would sit in it and we would know who you are and who you are to us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said... Amen, amen. I, all this st- talk about who is who and what is what, it really reminds me of a story back in college, back when I was at Southern Miss to the top. And I remember when I was a freshman in college that there was a time where I had to take a class, and it was the worst class I've ever taken. It was literally the hardest class I've ever taken my freshman year of college. It was Psychology 101. And it wasn't even like, like 
a 200 level class or a 300 level class or something that was like actually really difficult. It was one of those classes where you're sitting right in like the grand seating. There's like 300 other people in there and there's a TA just like pointing at the answers on the board. I don't know why this class was so hard for me, but it was the most difficult class that I've ever taken. I just couldn't get my head wrapped around it. I couldn't get my mind set into it. But I remember that halfway through the semester, there was a time where we were about to take a little quiz. And this quiz wasn't the midterm or anything. It was just like a little quiz the week before. And that we had a study guide, and she said, take this home, study it, and come back. It's a fill-in-the-blank quiz. I was like, okay, simple enough. So I went back, and I started, you know, trying to study a little bit, but then, you know, life and, and, and dating and video games and all of the things get in the way when you're a freshman in college, right? And so I didn't really get a chance to study probably like I should have. But I studied just enough to get a gist of what the test was going to be about. So we get to test day, and I remember sitting down and then putting the piece of paper in front of me. It was a list of like 20 questions, fill in the blank. And it says, who was the person that developed this idea of the id, the ego, and the superego? And I was like, simple, Sigmund Freud. And so then I get to question number two, and I start reading the question. I was like, hmm, this is interesting. It's really similar. Um, Sigmund Freud. And so then I get to question three and question four and question five, and I'm like, man, I'm really nailing this test because every answer is Sigmund Freud, Sigmund Freud, Sigmund Freud. And I get to question 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and I'm like, this teacher has done screwed up this test because every answer right here is Sigmund Freud. And man, I felt so confident. I felt so good about it. I was like, this is my chance, right? I get to go in and I'm like, this is gonna be an A100. I come back into class on Thursday with a little swagger and I'm like, yeah, man, I've got this nailed down. Just go ahead and give me the psychology degree. Let's do it. And then all of a sudden they lay down the paper and it was a 45 and I'm like, oh, hallelujah, this is not right. Because about every two and a half answers I got wrong. Apparently Sigmund Freud is not the answer to everything, especially even in psychology. There were a few more answers. There was a little bit deeper that I needed to go. And here's my question to you today. How many times in life do you take the blanks of your life, the places that you need to fill in, and you just begin writing in the answers that you think are the answer to it? How many times do you try to fill in the blanks of your life with a relationship, right? Or with work, or with all of these different things, maybe it's with an addiction, maybe you're trying to fill in the blank with anything that you know how to, to get rid of that despair, to get rid of that hopelessness, and you're just writing and scribbling the best that you know how, trying to fill in the blanks, maybe you even try to do it with religion. But can I tell you today that the answer to this question is not about what you know in your head, it's about what you know in your heart. And this is the question that we're going to be leaning into today. This is the question that Jesus was looking to when he says to the disciples, who do people say that I am? Because here's what I know, that the hardest journey for the gospel, the hardest journey that the gospel will ever take is the 18 inches between your head and your heart. This is the most important, difficult journey that it will ever take. So how do we decipher between the two? How do we begin to look at our life and say, do what I know about Jesus is who he is to me, something that I know in my head or something that I know in my heart? And this is what he says in Matthew chapter 16 when he comes to the disciples and they're in Caesarea Philippi. And I like to think of Caesarea Philippi kind of like as the New Orleans of first century Judea. It was like that place where like you wanted to go because there's good beignets, but it's a little dirty. So you kind of want to stay in the main line, right? Like you don't want to go all the way through. And then there was all this stuff surrounding Caesarea Philippi. It was just this idol after idol after idol after God after demigod. And there was this big cave in the background. And it's in the midst of all of this, in the midst of this craziness, in the midst of this turmoil, that Jesus stops. He turns around. And after three years of ministry, he looks at his disciples and says, who do people say that I am? And this is what they start to begin doing. This is what I love about the disciples is they never know how to answer that question. And so they start saying, they stammer. They're like, some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah. Still others say that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. What they're saying here, and the disciples are saying is that everybody else, all of these people are saying that you're a really good guy, that you're a miracle worker. Maybe you have a lot of truth to tell. They're writing in the blanks, right? They're filling in the blanks the best that they know how to. They're just trying to put something to paper in this moment. And they're saying, "Ah, something, I guess that you're a good person, that you're a prophet. Maybe for even some of us, you could be the political leader called the Messiah that the Jews were waiting for to overthrow Rome. That's what they were hoping for as well. But in this moment, they realized something, that maybe they had a lot of information about Jesus. 
And there's a reason why Jesus asked the question in this way, who do people say that I am? You see, there's a lack of proximity there. There's a lack of proximity in that moment when Jesus is saying this. He's saying, hey, who do people say that I am? Everybody else has heard about Jesus. It's not a lack of knowledge that these people don't know who he is. Think about it. Everybody in first century Judea knew who Jesus was. They knew about this rabbi from Nazareth who was coming and he was doing miracles. He was proclaiming this upside down kingdom of God. Everybody knew about Jesus. But there's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. Right? There's a difference there. And that's exactly what was going on with these people. They knew about Jesus, but they didn't know him. And it could be the same thing for us as well. For many of us who may be listening to my voice today, who may be tuning in for the very first time, you know a little bit about Jesus. You've maybe heard about it, or maybe you're here for the first time and you don't know that much about Jesus. Can I tell you something? That there's a difference between knowing about him and knowing him, and it's the difference between your head in your heart. You see, I know that there's two types of people who's listening today, who's tuning in, maybe at one of our locations, maybe online, right here in this room. There's two types of people who have a head knowledge of Jesus. The first is this, is the people who are seeking. They're actively seeking after God. Maybe you don't know a lot about this thing called faith. Maybe you don't know a lot about this thing called Christianity. Can I tell you and encourage you, keep seeking, keep looking after Keep trying to figure this out. Keep trying and praying and asking and coming to church and listening to what is being said about Jesus because I love what it says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. It says this, it says, you will seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all of your head. No, with all of your heart. You will seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all of your heart. That's that first group, people who are actively seeking to learn more about Jesus. There's a second group, though, and it's a group that, as I was growing up, I found myself a part of. It's the one who has spent maybe years or decades working on this working theology of what it means to be a Christian. And we have a lot of head knowledge. We have a lot of head knowledge about what this means, what faith means, but it hasn't dropped from our heads into our hearts. I know what that looks like. I was the kid growing up at church at two years old that was like, coloring Goliath purple on the coloring sheets. That was me. And I grew up my entire life, and I'm so thankful for that, y'all. I'm so thankful for a foundation of faith of knowing, but can I tell you, there's a difference between just gleaning information, gathering more facts, and actually being true to who we know God is and who Jesus is in our lives. This is what I know, that knowing Jesus truly doesn't come from religion. It comes from a relationship with him. It comes from a knowledge of him in our hearts, a proximity to him. This is what we see. Jesus going back to Matthew chapter 16. He he then flips the question up a little bit. He starts with, who do people say that I am? The people that don't have proximity to to me, the people who don't have relationship with me. And then he flips the question and he says this, but you, who do you say that I am? And it's in this moment that Peter, the disciple, that hard-headed disciple decides to step up. And after three and a half years of doing ministry with this rabbi from Nazareth, he comes to a conclusion. And everything in this moment, surrounded by all the turmoil of Caesarea Philippi, in this moment, things begin to drop from his head into his heart. And he, does, he goes beyond all of the prophet talk. And he says, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He has been forever changed because of his relationship and his proximity with Jesus. It's the relationship that happens from knowing who he is. And so then we ask this question, well, how do, how do we get that, Blake? Like, I hear all that. It sounds really good. How do we get there? Well, can I tell you that it's nothing that we can do on our own? I love what it says in verse 17. It says this, Jesus coming right after this moment, he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. A man, your own knowledge, your working knowledge hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. If you truly want to know Jesus today, if you truly want to see him move in your life and give you hope and give you purpose and begin to experience what it means to welcome home, then trust that God can move that information from your head to your heart. Romans 10, 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord, And you believe in your what? Believe in your head? No. Believe in your heart. That Christ is raised from the dead? You will be saved. You will be saved. This is what happened for me. There was a moment in my life when I knew a lot about Jesus. I knew a lot about faith. 
I knew a lot about what that story looked like, right? But it had not begun to move from my head into my heart and hadn't started to move me yet. I didn't know who Jesus was. There was so much bitterness and frustration in my life that I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what else to do. And there was finally a moment when I just started saying, okay, God, I can't do this on my own. I can't do this any longer. I can't take this season. I can't take the bitterness. I can't take the frustration. You have got to take it. And that's when I was introduced, y'all. That is when I was introduced to who Jesus is and who he is to me. He's the almighty one. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's my advocate. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the highest authority. He is the bread of life and the beloved son of God. He is the bridegroom, our chief cornerstone and our deliverer. He is faithful and true. He is the good shepherd and the great high priest. He is the head of the church and the holy servant. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is our indescribable gift. He is our judge and the lamb of God. He is the light of the world and the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the Lord of all. He is our mediator and our Messiah. He's the mighty one. He is the one who sets the captives free. He is our hope. He is our peace. He is our redeemer and he is our risen Lord. He's the rock of our salvation, the sacrifice for our sins, the loving savior. He is the son of man and the son of the most high God. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the door, the way, the truth truth, the life, the eternal word. He is the victorious one. He is wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is my savior and my best friend. He is Jesus. He is Jesus. And he can change your life forever. He can. Because this is what happens. When you believe all of that, you gain hope. Hope where it can never be found. Hope in the darkest of situations. Jesus brings hope because he brings healing and he brings purpose and he brings resurrection and he brings restoration in your life. Everything that you are feeling right now in this moment, if you have never experienced the goodness of Jesus Christ, you can have it today. And you can say in your heart of hearts, I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is our Lord. You can believe it. I love what it says in Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39. It kind of gives this picture of the hope that we have and the faith that we have in who Jesus is. It says, for I'm sure and I'm convinced of this, that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, including COVID, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. And ultimately, he is our victor. And every season that we face, we'll have to fall and submit to the name of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite passages of scripture is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. It says this, Have the same mind which is yours in Christ Jesus, who being in the very form of God didn't count equality with God as something to be grasped or to be taken advantage of. But instead, he emptied himself. He's by taking on the form of of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in that human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's the moment where hope, it felt like it died, but the story doesn't stop there. Verse nine, it says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Our story isn't finished. The story of his church isn't finished. I love how Jesus wraps up in Matthew 16. He says, after everything that that Simon just said, right, you are Christ, 
the Son of God. I believe in you. He wraps up the story with a statement. He says this. On this rock, on this statement of faith, I will build my church. And the gates of hell cannot, shall not, will not prevail against it. Who builds this church? Is it me? No. Is it Peter? No. Is it you? No. Jesus builds his church. And I am confident in this, that everything that we could ever face, everything that could ever come against us, will have to fall and bow at the name of our Savior and our Lord. So the question is this, who is Jesus to you? I'm going to ask all of us to stand across the room at all of our locations, even online at this moment. We're about to worship. We're about to give God everything that we have. This is the moment where you can choose to say who Jesus is to you, where you can testify and say, God, I believe in this. I'm confessing with my mouth, but I want to pray for us first. Before we move into that place, would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, we submit to you. We honor you, Lord. You are the author and the perfecter of our faith. And while we may be in the darkest of nights, while it may feel like the storm is rocking us on each and every side, the waves are crashing over and into the boat, Father, we know that you are the risen Savior and you are the true Lord. And that every difficulty, every circumstance, every sin that would beset us and entangle us and put us in chains would have to fall and bow at your name. Because you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. For any of us who may be coming in for the very first time or who may have never heard this word, never heard about Jesus, Father, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day that hope arrives, that hope rests on people, that you would open us to who you are. We love you, Fathers. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.